Let's thank the Lord. That's very awkward. Sit down. I'm kidding. I'm full of jokes this weekend. I, I was just going to say something I'm not going to say. It's Sunday. We're tired. Just kidding. We're good, actually. We slept good. I love sleep. I talked about that the other day. I love it. I am asking for sleep to be restored for the Lord's beloved. The enemy's robbed too much of our rest. Before I get going, Paul Keith left me. He'll be here in just a few minutes. Um, I do want to just say hi to our table family. Uh, Can you just stand real quick if you're part of our table? We have a table that meets on Sunday evenings. Wow, awesome. So glad you guys are able to come. And we will not be doing the table, obviously, tonight, because we'll be flying on an amazing WestJet plane. (laughs) Crooked like this. We're so spoiled. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul complaining about a WestJet plane? (laughs) Oh, thank you, Lord. So we have a table family that meets Sunday evenings. It's a a live uh, teaching and really cooperation. And we won't be meeting tonight. And hopefully you guys are watching or will watch the archive of um, the meeting this morning. So we love you all. And uh, we'll miss you until next week. So this morning I woke and let me pull up my notes here. I'll be fairly (laughs) quick-ish. I woke and I heard the Lord say, I want you to talk about the cornerstone and the capstone. I said, okay, well, I wasn't planning on that, so be patient with me while I pull that all up. And the Lord pulls it out of me. We were back in that room and worship had started and We were chit-chatting, and I felt this overwhelming pull. I started tearing up, and I felt a pull, like, get out there into worship. And I thought, oh, okay, I love that. And so I just got up kind of (laughs) mid-conversation. Sorry, Julie. And I was pulled out here, and I sat down, and they were singing about the cornerstone. And I thought, okay. And I just began to weep. Because God's so good. He's so good to tell us where we are, who we are, and who he is. So I want to talk just a minute, and I want to tell a really amazing supernatural um, uh, happening, I guess is the best way to explain it, that has to do with this capstone. Okay, so let me first just start with a few verses, and then I'm going to tell a story, and then he'll come up here and clean up anything I messed up while I was up here. He's so good at that. Like, okay, let's just clarify a few things. (laughs) Okay, I'm just going to read some verses here, and then we'll get to it. If I can find them. Okay, First Corinthians 3. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation. And another is building on it, but each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ. And we know that the Lord Jesus is the cornerstone. And in these days now, he, also, he is also the capstone. And we are the generation, the capstone generation that the Lord is going to move through. And this generation of kids that was up here today. So he is the cornerstone and he is the capstone. He is the beginning and the end. He is the alpha and he is the omega. He is the first and he is the last. You see the picture? It's so important to understand that picture because when we understand that picture, we understand the time that we're living in We understand who he is, and we understand who we are. The Christ within us, hope of glory. It is the capstone generation. 
Let's read Zechariah 4. He said to me, this is the word of the Lord to, uh, to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plain, and he will bring it forth the top stone, the capstone, with shouts of grace, grace. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. He will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? That these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. Now this capstone generation, that's us. We will operate in the sevenfold spirit of the Lord. We're familiar, all of you familiar with the sevenfold spirit in Isaiah chapter 11? Anyone not familiar? Okay, let's read the verse in Isaiah 11. A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The sevenfold spirit of God. It is Yeshua. And he is in us and he is going to operate through us in this hour. The greatest light the world has ever seen. The scripture says we will do greater than even Jesus. As he fills us and we have come into union with him. The greatest hour in history. The capstone generation. It is the Lord. He is the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. It's going to operate through us. In a great final display of his glory. For the sake of union and for the sake of the harvest. And it will happen. Let me tell you a little bit about his might and his provision in regards to this about the capstone and the cornerstone. About a year and a half ago, close to two years ago, I had a, <clears throat> I had a dream. And in the dream, Paul Keith and I, it was actually more like I, I was able to see into the spirit and into the eternal realm. And Paul Keith and I were standing there and the Lord came before us propped higher than we were. And he came and he, he gave us an option for some dates of when um, we, if we would agree to a certain date that he was going to use us for something great. And we both agreed to the same date and the Lord imparted it into, into us like this, into both of us. We were given it like a gift that we might go and do this great thing in the timing that he says. Because we cannot go outside his timing and his will. He was pleased that we chose the time that we did. That we weren't going to rush it. Let me read a scripture. Well, I'm just going to keep on. I'll go back to those in a minute. So we receive that date. And I look over and I see a mountain with no top, no capstone. as a flat top mountain. And the Lord takes us and he places us on a certain location on that mountain. A certain spot. And the encounter, the experience ended. And I woke with the sense of the capstone comes with shouts of grace, grace. Because it was a flat top mountain like a pyramid with no capstone on it. And I had a sense of that. The capstone comes with shouts of grace, grace. So some months go by, and that year I had literally been through hell. I had just buried a, one of our closest friends, who my kids called Uncle Randy. Uh, my dad um, died, and I was with him the end of his life, leading him into, I had the beautiful privilege of leading him into a place of, as an overcomer, just in the moments before he died of cancer. Cancer had, you know... And there were a lot of other very difficult trials. 
and I could barely stand. And the Lord said, I want you to go hike Mount St. Helens. <laughs> and I hadn't put together at the time, I have a friend and she and I do a lot of mountains. We like to hike and do this, um, spend that time with the Lord and we can talk for hours and she's very easy to be around. And so we were going to, um, we were planning another mountain hike. So we went to, we decided, we'll do Mount St. Helens. And I hadn't put together the encounter yet. And then I realized, okay, I remember my dream. And if you know, Mount St. Helens erupted, so it's flat on the top. And it's actually very much shaped like a pyramid. Very, very much what I saw in my experience. So I was at the end, and I was heading up Mount St. Helens with my dad's ashes on my back. And a whole lot of burden. I was 15 pounds heavy in burden. And something quite terrible had happened um, that month. I didn't think I would make it. And she laughs now, but she says normally she's got little legs. She's little and I'm always steps ahead of her, and she says she's normally flying up ahead of me, but I had to drag her up, and the prayers pulled me up. Well, I was going through a lot, so I didn't really prepare the right way, so I didn't have enough water, and I had too much electrolyte water, where if you hike or work out, you know, electrolyte water will, it'll keep you hydrated, but you're still thirsty, and so I was really, really thirsty, my soul was dry, my, uh, my spirit was like, I was struggling, and I was physically dry. And I said, God, you have to do something. I am so thirsty, and I'm not going to make it. Well, this mountain, there are no streams. It's a rock with ashes. There are no streams, and you read, and you can watch every video and read everywhere, and you know there's no outlet. They tell you, leave water halfway up the mountain so that you have it on the way down because you'll never find water on this mountain. So I was aware of that. And we're hiking up and we're declaring Isaiah 43, 19. Can we just read this verse? We know it, but can we read it? I'm going to read 18 through 21. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder the things of the past. Behold, I'll do something new. Now it will spring forth. Remember that word. Will you not be aware of it? I will make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. So I'm declaring literally with every step, Isaiah 43, 19, now it will spring forth. I can't go on anymore, God. I'm going to need a spring forth. And right as we're declaring, and I have just taken like my second bout of oxygen, which I've never had to do, we look over and there's this water bubbling up from out of the rock and the ashes. And we're looking over and we're like, Okay. Is it snow melt? I don't know. So we keep hiking. We finish the hike. Paul Keith was taking the aerial view of us from the Find My and um, took us a, a snapshot of where we were, the exact location we had been placed in my dream. And before the hike, she told me, The Lord told me I'm walking for Paul Keith. She didn't know what that meant. So we continue up. My daughter and I did a little thing for my dad's ashes. We had a little, th a little thing of his ashes, and we, we honored my dad. And, and then we went back down. And on our way back down, that little bubbling up of water tripled in size and was a full spring, like rivers of living water, spring going down. People were rushing to the water to, to fill up their bottles. And the Lord spoke to me, and he says, drink, it's living water. Now it will spring forth. So I filled the water, made everybody drink, finished my, um, 
our journey down the mountain, and my friend and my daughter laughed because they had to, my daughter was up an hour and a half before we were having fun and glissading down the mountain on her, on her bum, you know, she's a teenager. I was leaping after I drank the water. I was out in front, and they're like, can you slow down? And I'm like, I can't. I was filled with such an energy and a strength. I knew I was going to make it through that year and that this capstone's coming. I knew it. It was a confirmation to me that he's good. The springing forth is happening, but it was a confirmation that this capstone generation is here. We are going to see the greatest move of his spirit we've ever seen before. And I needed a miracle, a real miracle. So I went back and for a couple of hours, I researched the internet and talked to everybody I knew that knows about that mountain, trying to discredit the um, miracle that had just happened. Paul Keith says, you were trying to make sure. And I said, no, I was trying to discredit it. It was like... Did that happen? Absolutely. It was a miracle. The Lord made water where there was no water. Let me read a verse, and then I'm going to pray for an increase of faith to believe for this capstone generation. This capstone generation, it's the righteous generation that will walk by faith. Let me read this verse here in Psalm 14, verse 3 through 5. They've all turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of wickedness not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? They are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. That's this generation of kids. And that's our children and children's children. And we're going to move into that. This is the breaking forth and the breaking in now. We're moving through the doorway into that era of time. The greatest time in history. The darkest hour and yet a great light shining. That is the capstone generation. So I pray right now, Lord. I'm asking you, God, won't you give us faith? Faith to move as a righteous generation and faith to believe, to believe that this capstone generation, that this great move of your spirit is here for us, that it's coming. Won't you strengthen us in this time with waters of living water that we can endure through the dark hour and move in as great lights that shine in the darkness? Let it be, Lord, as it lines up with your will. That we might move in the sevenfold spirit of your glory. Sevenfold spirit of your glory. That we would know your spirit, Lord. That it would rest upon us. That we would know wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and the reverential fear of the Lord. Isaiah 43, 19, he says, now it will spring forth. It was for the purpose that the people might revere him and sing praises to his name. I'm asking for the reverential awe of the Lord to fill this land in Canada, to fill the hearts of the people that we would be moved by awe. Because we revere you, because you are good. I prophesy it to be reverence in the land and in the hearts, in Jesus' name. Awesome. That's great, sweetie. Wow, <clears throat> that was good. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> well, we'll have you out before dinner time tonight, so don't get nervous. So, yeah, that was so good. You know, um, as she was uh, just sharing that, I, I need to say hello to everybody first because I forget things. But Johnny, we've had a great time here. You guys have been awesome. I just, you know, we consider this home, away from home. You know, I've always felt that way. We love you guys. We have such um, 
you know, a, a love for our Canadian extended family. So we have always been so honored to be here. We hope that what we've shared has blessed you and helped you along the way. And we'll continue this morning. And we also welcome our table group that's here as well. But thank you, Johnny. You guys are awesome. Johnny's one of my favorites. I got to admit that, you know. I, years and years ago, I... <laughs> You know, years and years ago, you know, back after, right after World War II, no, it was, um, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, we would, I'd come up here to, you know, to speak at the conference, and we'd go to lunch, and Johnny would just grill me, just, you know, all right, now tell me about the Antichrist, what's, you know, tell me about, you know, what's it going to look like when, you know, all these Daniel prophecies, and he would just, I knew, man, if I'm going up to Canada, I better have all my P's and Q's ready, because... Johnny was going to grill me, so I like that. I appreciate that. But, you know, um, much of what we have been sharing over the course of the last couple of days has been dealing with this subject of Alpha and Omega. You know, last night we both shared about Omega prayer and Omega ministry. Well, you could also relate that to Capstone and, you know, to Cornerstone and Capstone. The Lord is the cornerstone, but he is also the capstone, correct? He is the Alpha, and he's also the Omega. And the prophecy of Zechariah tells us that the hands of Zerubbabel, correct? Well, she just read the scripture to you. Uh, Zerubbabel is a type of Christ. So the hands, the anointing, the glory, the power that laid the foundation will be the hands that bring the capstone. The Omega ministry, the same glory, the same power, the same demonstration of the Spirit, the same, you know, dimension of grace that was given to bring the beginning will bring the end. So we want to leave you, I think if, if we were to leave you this, uh, this weekend with one final just push and admonition is, listen, we're about to see the greatest outpouring of the Spirit the world has ever seen. That's a, that's a biblical fact. That's not to encourage you. We've already taken the offerings. <laughs> it's what I believe. It's what I've staked my life on. And I believe I can give you a lot of biblical scriptures to support that position. That the Lord is going to bring a grand finale. A consummation of the ages. The capstone. And when the capstone comes, it will be with shouts of grace, grace. There will be a demonstration of glory. Everybody. And we supported, I know not everyone here now was here throughout the weekend, but we pretty well established that Joel chapter 2, you know, the great day of Pentecost scripture that Peter quotes, remember that one? Uh, you know, I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind and you'll prophesy and all that, remember? Well, that actually has its truest fulfillment after Israel becomes a nation. You can prove that by, by Joel chapter 2. I, I won't go too much into that. But it says, after this, then I will pour out my spirit, right? Well, then you have to say, after what? And you go back to verse 18 of Joel chapter 2, and you find out that that prophecy has its truest fulfillment after the restoration of Israel. And then it goes on to say, even in, in Acts chapter 2, after this, but before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So it gives you the bookends. After Israel's restored, but before the Lord judges the earth with, with the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, Jacob's trouble, all these phrases that are in the Old Testament, in that window of time, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon everybody, and everybody is going to have an opportunity to either accept or reject the Lord. Because Jesus said, this gospel must be preached to the whole world, did he not, in Matthew 24? And the unfortunate news is not everybody's going to accept the Lord, but when the judgment comes, nobody's going to be able to say, wow, if I'd only known. Well, you did. That's why this last outpouring will be the greatest. And I'll pour out my spirit upon all mankind. So I absolutely believe this, this message is right about the, the cornerstone is also the capstone, the demonstration of the Lord. You can support that with so many biblical verses. You know, Romans chapter 8, one of the ones we love the most, you know, that all of creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the huios, is the word in Greek, mature sons of God, which brings us to another one. You know, uh, Ephesians chapter 4. If this wasn't in the Bible, I've got to be honest, I'd have a hard time believing if somebody were to just say this without it being in the Bible, but it says that we have apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers, right? Okay. Until... 
All right? Until what? The unity of the faith, the true knowledge of God, and till there is a mature man to the fullness of the stature that belongs to Christ. I'm going to say that one again. <laughs> there will be a mature man on this earth, and they will have the fullness of the stature of Christ. Now, if that wasn't in the Bible, I'd have a hard time believing that, but it is. And so I'm just going to have to believe the Lord is big enough to pull that off. That he can pour his spirit out and make us ready. Which kind of brings me to what I, well, I want to tie in to what, you know, Amy was just sharing. Um, you know, I had some wonderful notes all prepared for this morning and the Lord says, well, those are nice notes, but maybe one day I'll let you use them. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to have to kind of wing it a little bit here this morning, which I love to do by, by the way. But, um, you know, for me, I, I had an experience years ago, I, back in the nineties, I would more so than recent, especially, but I would hear an audible voice in my room. Now, whether it was external or internal, I, I can't say. And so, I mean, I don't want to imply to you it happened every day, but it happened enough that the things that were spoken, I'm still holding on to. But one of them was, I heard this audible voice in my room say, the apostolic is coming, the apostolic is coming, and Samuel is a type of this apostolic leadership. For I did let none of his words fall to the ground, nor did he beg his bread from the people. That was the phrase. I'll never forget as long as I live. And so I haven't really taught a lot lately from, from Samuel, but you can imagine, you know, back in the 90s, Samuel and I were buddies after that. I read everything I could find on Samuel, you know, all the, the commissioning and the, the whole story of Samuel. I, I will tell you a little something funny, and you know, that, that's an absolutely true story. Uh, I'm not exaggerating this at all, but I, I had leased back in those years about 2,000 acres of land to, to hunt, hunt on, deer hunt. And, um, and so, uh, I was in business, had a little more money than you have when you're in ministry. But anyway, uh, I had to turn it over to my younger brothers, you know, after I went in ministry. But anyway, uh, so I would go out on this 2000 acres of land, which was way out in the middle of Mississippi, you know, like maybe some places like in Alberta, just way from, you know, miles from any city or town, you know, and, um, it was owned by a big, um, paper mill, a lumber company, Georgia Pacific was the name of it. But anyway, they owned all this land where they grew trees. So I'm out on this land, and uh, of course, you got to remember now, this was before the days of iPhones and iPads, right? So I used to carry around a little micro cassette recorder. You know, remember those, you know, little mi miniature little tape thing, you know, and and uh, if I'm walking along, I didn't want to carry pen and paper, in my, you know, while I'm walking out. Mississippi, it was hot and muggy and sweaty. And so I would stick this little recorder in my pocket. And if I got a, a word from the Lord, I would take it and record it rather than carry a Bible or carry a pen and paper. So I, I was doing that. So I'm walking now. I can, I can take you to the very spot where this happened. And so I'm walking along and I'm meditating on Samuel, you know. And uh, by myself, out in the woods, I mean, big, tall pine trees, and I'm walking along, and I heard behind me a voice. And I stopped, and I threw my arm, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. <laughs> and I thought, God sounds like me. <laughs> and I reached, and somehow I had turned my recorder on. <laughs> True story. And I looked around, I think, I hope nobody saw that. <laughs> Thank the Lord I'm out in the middle of the wood. Nobody, and it was me. My recorder had been turned on. and Because it said something like, and the Lord said, you know. I mean, it was, it was one of those kind of things. Oh, God. That is a true story. I swore I'd never tell anybody. And the Lord said, oh, yeah, you will. <laughs> I'll finish it off with another one. I, not long after that, I was out there again praying, you know, so hot no shirt on, sweaty, and, you know, I'm thinking nobody's out there, you know, and so there's a little opening there, and so I just got down on my knees and was praying, <laughs> so I'm sitting there on my knees and no shirt on, I had my hands raised, and I'm praying out loud, just praying all this stuff, and my eyes were closed, I don't know what it is about praying, I close my eyes, you don't have to, but I do it anyway, sometimes I'm driving my car, and I'll close my eyes, I, I kind of need to not do that, 
But I had my eyes closed, and I'm praying out loud, you know. And, but I could sense somebody was close by. And so, <laughs> so I, I opened my eyes, and there were two men standing there. And they were like... <laughs> they had their heads bowed like this, you know. And, and, I'm, I, I, and I'm on my knees. And, I, I look, and they, they said, uh, I'm so sorry to bother you. Our truck got stuck way back up in the woods. <laughs> And we need a ride. You have a truck somewhere. I said, oh, my Lord, you know. <laughs> Neither one of them wanted to sit next to me in the truck. They both wanted to sit in the back seat. <laughs> True story. I'm like, oh, my Lord, you know, these guys. I'm thinking, Hopefully I'll never see those two men ever again the rest of my life. Samuel is a type of this apostolic leadership. There's a verse, two verses I want to stress this morning because I really feel like the Lord said some of you are about to be changed into another person. <clears throat> Samuel, you know, was a profound prophet. I could just spend so much time. The accuracy of his words. The Lord did let none of his words fall to the ground. That didn't mean that he went around saying whatever he wanted to say and God backed him up. He was in such union with the Lord the Lord spoke, and he spoke on behalf of the Lord, and the Lord and the words never failed. And one of the things I want to stress this morning, just in the amount of time we have left, was the commissioning of Saul. Now, I know Saul didn't end well, but he started out pretty well. He started out really good. You know, and I'm going to just kind of briefly tell you the scenario. Samuel was a seer, a seasoned prophet. He went around judging the cities of Israel and so forth. He would come into a city and the elders of the city would go out and say, you here for good or bad, you know, uh, because if you're here with a word of judgment, we're in big trouble. But if you got a good word, come on in, you know, because when he showed up, something happened. And so he was well known. And if you remember the story, Saul's father had lost some donkeys. So he sends Saul to go try to find them and he couldn't find them. He said, let's. His servant said, let's go see the seer and uh, take a gift to him, and he'll tell us where the, prophet, where the donkeys are. Where is that prophet nowadays? You know, why aren't we seeing like that is my question. That's another subject. You know, and so they, they go to, to, to uh, find Samuel. Meanwhile, the day before, the Lord comes to Samuel and says, Samuel, now tomorrow, about this time, I'm going to send a young man your way. He's going to be a Benjamite. He's going to be taller than everybody else, more handsome than everybody else. He's going to be, um, you know, this, this, and this. And, you know, I want you to commission him to be ruler over my people. And so Samuel's looking for him. And as a result, he tells the cook, tomorrow night I'm going to, be, I'm going to have a dinner. I'm going to be inviting this young man that I haven't met yet because the Lord's going to have me anoint him as ruler over Israel. Take apart this leg, this this choice piece of meat, he told the cook, set it apart and hold it until the appointed time. So Saul, of course, you know, the next day, you know, it's almost like Samuel has been looking for him all day. He shows up. He says, tonight you're going to have dinner with me. And so they go to have dinner, and this is the wording. Then the cook took the leg with which had been set apart for Saul. And Samuel said, here is what has been reserved. Set it before you and eat because it has been kept for you until the appointed time. There has been meat set apart for you and I until the appointed time. There is a scripture in Psalm 145. We have used it for our podcast it talks about all eyes on you for you give us meat and due season and there is this uh, this parable this metaphor the, the Lord uses in the book of Matthew where he's talking about the conditions that will exist on the, on the earth immediately prior to his return in other words you might can say he was talking about you and I and he was telling the people the conditions that will exist out in culture and which we're seeing, by the way. But he also starts this, um, this series of, of analogies. He said, well, it's, like, it's going to be like this. Remember, 
uh, and there'll be two people at, at a well, and one will be taken and one will, be, will not be taken. And, and he gives these two different illustrations where one's taken, one's not taken. And then he talks about the servants, you know, where a master sends his servant to take care of his household. And one set of servants are faithfully serving the master. The others, they think he's delayed. He's probably not going to be coming anytime soon. And they're unfaithful. Then he moves right into Matthew 25. See, we, don't, we, we see a chapter break, but there wasn't one when the Lord spoke that. So Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, is a continuation of the thought process of one to be ready, one will not be ready. One will be taken, one will not be taken. You understand that? Then he tells the parable of the ten virgins. See, people forget what leads up to that. But it, it says here in Matthew chapter 25 that uh, the faithful servants will be given the people meat in due season. A reserved portion. In other words, let me rephrase it another way. Right before the Lord returns, the true, genuine, anointed leaders in the body of Christ are going to access revelation that's never been prophesied and begin to delegate it to the people to make them ready for what's coming. Did you get that? And as I said last evening, the Lord is looking for the forerunners that are willing to do that. The ones that are willing to pay out a little bit of a price to go behind the veil and access the mysteries of the kingdom, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hidden in Christ, the things which eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard, the things which have not yet even entered into the heart of man that God said he'll reveal to this body of people. It goes on to say that. Oh that's my phone. That is really weird. Okay. Who is it? Terry Bennett? Okay. <laughs> so anyway. Sorry about that. That was my phone. I'm thinking. How rude of somebody to let their phone ring in church. It was, it was mine. Okay. Oh well. But I was in the middle of quoting 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <laughs> but the Spirit searches the depths of God and brings out of the heart of God. In other words, where are these mysteries of the kingdom? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, they're in the heart of God. And I saw this in an experience not too long ago where, where the, the Father spoke to me and said that it is his deepest desire to present a bride worthy of his son. And so these secrets have been held in the heart of the Father. And the Spirit searches the depths of God. For no man knows the heart of a man, but the Spirit of the man. Even so, the Spirit of God searches the depths of God to pull out of him these mysteries and, and secrets. And what do we do? We combine spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. You see this parallel of what I'm trying to draw for you. We, we, can, we can do this. <laughs> that there is a revelation that we see behind the veil. That's the thoughts of God. If I have a thought about my wife, she doesn't know what that thought is unless I say it in a word, right? A word is a thought expressed, even though that's not always true. Sometimes she knows my thoughts when I don't say them. But anyway, for my, for my analogy's sake, <laughs> a, a word is a thought expressed, correct? And so we will access the thoughts of God. I know the thoughts I have for you, says the Lord. Plans of welfare and not for calamity to give you a future and a hope. And our job as a generation will be to prophesy the thoughts of God with spiritual words. You will be a prophetic generation. You will be men and women of prophecy. It says in Joel chapter 2 and also in Acts chapter 2 that you, you shall prophesy. But it also says over in Revelation chapter 10, you must prophesy. At the very last of the, day of, the, of the age before the Lord returns, which we're it. I can prove it to you, but I believe you believe that already. The Lord comes and he sets his foot on the land and the sea. Remember that passage? It's powerful prophetic word in Revelation chapter 10 
where all the seals are broken and the Lord now holds that book in his hand and he, he brings it from heaven to earth. It is, it is revealed in heaven, but the Lord himself brings that book to the earth, to the last day generation. All the seals are broken. Things that were concealed in the days of Daniel are now to be revealed at the last outpouring of the Spirit to a prophetic generation of people. And the Lord offers the book to this remnant community of people. He says, now you must eat it. Eat the book. It'll be sweet in your mouth but bitter in your belly. Why? Because you must prophesy again to the final Gentile outpouring of the Spirit. So I hope you're seeing that we will be prophetic. Contrary to what cessationists say, we will be a prophetic generation. I can prove that by the Bible. And so what am I releasing on you today? I'm releasing a prophetic mantle. Now after Saul had dinner, you know, with Samuel... He said, now tomorrow, I'm going to send you on your way. <laughs> and this is what I'm contending for, this level of prophetic. And I'm going to have to kind of, for the sake of time, I'll paraphrase. But he says, okay, you know, the morning comes and Samuel takes a horn of all oil and he pours it on Saul. And he says, now here's the deal. Now, you're going to go down the road a little piece. And when you get to a certain tree, this particular oak tree, when you get to that tree, three men are going to approach you, and one of those three men is going to have three goats. One of them will have three loaves of bread. One of them will have a jug of wine. When you get to that tree, the, one of the guys with the, with the bread is going to offer you to you two loaves of bread. You're to take the two loaves of bread, then you continue on your journey. When you get to the Philistine garrison, there'll be a group of prophets coming off the high places where they've been worshiping the Lord. They'll have harps and tambourines and so forth, and they'll come down off the high place prophesying. And when you meet those guys, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you, and you're going to prophesy, and you'll be changed into another man. Verse 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy and you will be changed into another man. That's what I want for us today. This is the prophetic word I felt like we were to release for you today as part of this capstone anointing that's coming is that something will come on. You might say, oh, you know what, I'm a little timid. Not if you're changed into another person. Well, you know, I don't really get a lot of revelation. Not if the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. Not if you begin to eat the open book. You're, you're going to be so full of revelation, you, it's going to come out of your pores. You're going to sweat revelation. <laughs> you're going to get in a group of people. I love it because my wife can, it's so funny because when she's really had an encounter with the Lord, I'll be laying in bed going to sleep. I shall have a Sunday, baby. Oh, my God. What? She's, I said, what is it? She said, I didn't mean to. It just came out. <laughs> True story. I'm like, okay. Oh, boy. You never know when she's going to break in tongues. Why? It's just coming out, right? Do you see it? The analogy. You're going to be so full. You, you're going to say, I don't know how to prophesy. Well, when you're full of revelation, you might, you know, now I know what you're thinking. You gotta, to prophesy, I've got to say, now, thus saith the Lord. And, no, 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 no. That's long gone. You know how to prophesy now? Just whatever is in your belly comes out of your mouth. The Lord is good. The Lord is going to reveal himself in ways he's never done it before. That's prophesying. There's going to be a generation of people that are going to know their God and they're going to do exploits to his glory. That's prophesying. See, just whatever is in your belly just comes out of your mouth. Because the Bible says, I believe the Lord told me he's going to change some of you into another person. By this time next year, you're not going to be who you are right now. You're not going to be afraid of prophecy. You're not going to be afraid to, to stand up and just say whatever the Lord is saying in you. You're going to be changed. The Spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you. You know, how about Peter, James, and John? How about when the Spirit of the Lord came upon them on the day of Pentecost? One minute they're hiding out behind closed doors. The next minute they fall out into the streets prophesying to everybody. <laughs> had no concern. One minute they're afraid for their lives, running for their lives. The next minute they don't mind if they're, if they're martyred. Peter even said, I'm going to be crucified upside down. Why? They were changed into another man. They were filled with something that made them what they weren't before. They became men and women of valor. 
because of what came upon them. So we're not going to do it because of our own strength. We're going to do it because we carry something of another world, another dimension. We're, we're four-dimensional people, multi-dimensional people, really, to be honest. We're going to access another dimension. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We will look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are unseen are eternal. Men and women that access the eternal realm of God because something has come upon them. And they begin to see with eyes they didn't have before. Do you believe you can do that? I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you blatantly, bluntly, forcefully. We're about to have an outpouring of the Spirit unlike any we've ever seen before. You might say, well, I got the Holy Ghost back in 1982. Well, not like this one. I'm, I'm, I mean, there's something coming. We're about to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. He has to do it. The Lord has to do it. It's in his word. There will be a fiery people. The Lord told me, tell the people to get acclimated to the fire. And, and he gave me uh, Revelation chapter 15. I know many people are afraid of the book of Revelation. I love it. You know, my wife and I, we were sitting at a ball game with people around us, and we're, all, we're talking about Revelation and, and, you know, the Antichrist and all this stuff, and she's looking around, and people are starting to move to other, you know. She's like, I wonder if everybody's talking about this at this ball game. And I'm like, probably not, you know. Revelation chapter 15 is a is a image of the throne room at a certain point in God's plan. But here is the part that I'm after. It's describing the throne room, and he says, Before the throne is a sea of glass mingled with fire, and upon that sea of glass are the victorious ones. That's you and I, the overcomers. That's the same word. Nakio is the word. It's used seven times. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to him that overcomes, right? To him that is a victor, to him that conquers, to him through the overcomers. And it says those group of people, when there's great judgment being taking place on the earth, let me just go ahead and tell you, there's judgments taking place on the earth, but where are the overcomers? They're standing on the, on the sea of glass that's mingled with fire. Oh, boy. And the Lord says, because they've become acclimated to the fire. Men and women of fire, men and women that are acclimated to the anointing, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon us, as Amy said, giving us the spirits of wisdom and revelation, counsel and might, knowledge in the reverential fear of the Lord. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint every person here. You know what? I'm, I'm going to release a word and maybe tomorrow morning, some of you will get it. Maybe a week from now, a month. But between now and this time next year, we'll, we'll make an appointment to be back here about this time next year. I'm just, we'll see how that works out. But, but I'm going to believe that you're not going to be the same person by this time next year that you are right now. And as I say that, I, want you, I wanted to also go into a little bit about Solomon, but I don't, you know, it's just a whole nother sermon, and the Lord took me a different direction. But Solomon meditated before the Lord on what he wanted from the Lord, and the Lord said, I'll give you what you've asked for, because what you've meditated on was pleasing to God. So I'm asking you right now, what do you really, if, you, if God showed up to you today and said, ask anything you want, what would it be? I ask myself that question often, and I'm, my answers have changed over the years. The more I've matured and grown, I think my answers have changed. I used to say, oh, I want ministry, you know. Now I'm like, oh, I want to access the Father. I want to hear the Lord say, come up here and I'll show you what will take place hereafter and those kinds of things. So, Lord, I'm praying that there will be an impartation this morning of change and transformation, a metamorphosis. That men and women in this room right now will be changed by what they see and hear. That there will be encounters that are given to every person. I'm, I'm going to claim it for everyone in this room. No matter where you are in your journey. No matter where you are in your journey. That the Lord will begin to reveal something to you. 
and that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you'll begin to prophesy. And when you do, you'll be changed into another man and another woman and another young person because of what's come upon you. I believe the Lord's big enough to pull it off. He loves to take the things that are weak just to confound the wise. He loves to take the unqualified and put himself on them and do great things to his glory. So don't think that you're not qualified. Don't think that you're not uh, educated enough. Don't have enough seminary degrees. The Lord, the Lord says, I love to take those kinds of people to change the world. So let it, let it happen to us this morning. One final prayer. I just pray, Lord. I, I, can feel the, um, I can feel something stirring around up here. I've been waiting for that. With that comes the assignment of the angelic. Open the heavens right here in this place, Lord, where the angels ascend and descend upon this place. I'm going to ask for a special grace to come here for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. That people will come here to get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's an old school Pentecostal term. And they will come here to get the Holy Spirit, to be infilled with the Holy Spirit. And with fire. You might say, well, I had that experience 10 years ago. Well, you need it again. You need a fresh infilling of the Spirit. You need a fresh infilling of prophecy. You need a word to be put in your mouth that you can prophesy that word to your family, to your city, to your region. Lord, change the people in this room by your Spirit, I ask in Jesus' name. I had a weird picture when I was um, sitting there. Weird is maybe not the right word to use, but I saw a kite, and I saw the, the kite tethered by the one who's, you know, guiding the kite. I had a sense of like a, I don't know, a childhood experience, maybe with family members with a kite or a parent that often flies a kite with their kids. It sounds totally not something I've ever seen before. So it might be somebody online, maybe it's you in this room, had to do with a kite and a, a memory and experience, maybe a good memory flying kites as a kid, or maybe you fly them with your kid. Could be someone online. Is that anybody in this room? Okay. Oh, in the back. Okay. And the, there's, is there two hands? Okay. One hand. Okay. So for you, will you come up? Okay. Will you come up so I can pray for you? Just because it was such a strong picture. I know we'll, I'll be very quick. Hi. Oh, wow. There's a couple with memories with kites. <laughs> what a unique picture. The Lord's so... Um, I felt very drawn to you. I'm going to pray. I'll pray for all of you real quickly. Um, but I'm going to pray real quickly for you. I felt a draw to that side of the room. So there was a memory of some sort with these kites. And I had a sense for you. Can I be free and share with you here? Okay. And um, I had a sense that there was a... Um, a struggle at times to know that you were tethered to the Lord. You know that you are, you have that knowing inside, but there was a struggle like, do you got me? Do you got me? And I just want to tell you now he's got you and you've begin to walk in that in your life. You're walking in the, the, um, the confidence of that, but I'm affirming it to you right now. He's got you in the same way that the person who's flying the kite at the tethered. And I have this sense that in the days moving forward, you're going to catch wind going to catch a great wind with him and soar. And it has been your desire. You've already seen it kind of picking up in the recent days. Is that true? And it's going to really take off in this next year. So in the next year, when we come back, you're not going to be the same. There's going to be a soaring that begins to take place. So I just want to bless you in it, release you into that. I feel a sense of releasing you into that place, into the wind of his spirit, unlike you've seen before, known before. There's a great prophetic gifting and you have sometimes pushed it down and not spoken with the confidence that you know um, it, it's in you. You feel it in you that the word is right and you haven't spoken it. So right now, I want to free, free you in that. From this day moving forward, a confidence in the things of the kingdom that you know they're in you. They're going to come forth from your mouth, pouring forth with fire. I have that scripture sitting there um, when it's like fire shut up in your bones and you have to prophesy and that's you. You represent a generation too that will prophesy and you're going to teach people in it 
how to find that courage in the Lord to prophesy. It's coming to you a boldness unlike you've known before. The dreams will become stronger, the vision stronger. You're going to see them, you're going to know, and you're going to move towards what you see in the vision. And you're going to prophesy it. And you have a strong authority that you have been given. A strong authority by the Lord. And you're going to move in it stronger and greater in these days. In Jesus' name.